Tonight's guest is Mike Colantonio. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. How are you? Well, I'm doing good, but more importantly, how are you? I'm okay. I'm all right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Mike, please give us a brief bio on yourself. <laughs> all right. No pressure, huh? So, I grew up on Long Island, New York. Uh, you know, Sicilian family. You know, run-of-the-mill average guy. Went through every trade under the sun. Didn't really care for anything, so... Eventually, I joined the Army around 23. Stayed in for, I had a two and a half year contract, but I stayed in for another year and a half to uh, to go overseas to Afghanistan. When I got back, I was just basically dumped off into society and very, very lost for multiple reasons. Uh, I was dealing with addiction and I was dealing with, uh, you know, a lot of PTSD and some other issues. So uh, eventually I went in for some help after a while of trying to do it myself. And uh, over those five years, I, uh, you know, five or six years, I did a lot of healing and started doing a lot of like, you know, spiritual healing and learning Reiki and meditation and things like that, which really started to open me up as an individual. And I really wasn't finding my place in the world back in society. So I started taking to the woods and I had too many social anxieties. So I, I, I found myself going in the woods nonstop, probably once or twice a day, at least for, for a couple of hours each. And I had a very deep interest in Sasquatch, but it wasn't an understanding or even a full necessarily belief yet. And I didn't necessarily think that I had the chance of seeing on where I was. So, you know, you have to go in the middle of nowhere. It's what it's what I thought. You had to go in the middle of the mountains and scream and bang on trees, etc. And uh, I only knew what I knew from what I knew at that point, which was not much. And uh, that's pretty much when I I was planning to go to the Pacific Northwest when I had my encounter, which put a screeching halt on my trip. And uh, I started to, you know, it was very traumatic for me. And there was nothing threatening. There was nothing threatening there at all. It just was sheer size and fear my reaction dropped me to the floor and uh when i look back he was you know it was gone and mind you my last job was a soldier uh, in combat and the fight or flight was flight fight wasn't an option but my body and had reacted to say flight but go just go down just go down and hope nothing happens you know, beg for help, you know, and mind you, again, it, it was, I don't think anything bad was going to happen, but at the time, I could not process that. I couldn't process it. So at this point, you know, this is when people decide I'm never going back in the woods ever, ever again, or I got to get some answers. So I chose the latter and started to go back in and started to reach out to a lot of people and you know, a few years later, I've been doing that steadily, uh, just kind of going out there as often as possible as a blank slate, and, you know, no pre preconceived notions or preconceived ideas, no matter how much I learn or how much I take in. I try and just step out there every day and say, you know, hey, universe, hey, woods, hey, mother nature, what do you got for me today? And uh, as much as you try to prepare and cover yourself in protection sometimes other things can uh, affect you and find you and reach out and i've had to learn the hard way especially with dogman which is why we're here today and uh, yeah i mean that's about it i guess in a nutshell it goes without saying i'm so glad you're able to get back on the horse and head out into the woods, and it also goes without saying, I can't thank you enough for your service to our country. I'm just so sorry to hear that 
your experiences overseas have affected you the way they have. Yeah, yeah, it's very unfortunate. I I do consider myself one of the lucky ones to be able to recover and you know come back from that. And it is a constant process, right? With any kind of trauma, it uh, it requires constant work. But I appreciate that, Vic. Thank you. Well, you know, you're welcome, bud. Yeah, just telling it like it is. I really do appreciate it. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Comparing the two, your dogman encounters, which obviously have hit you very hard, and then your experiences overseas in the military, which one has been harder to deal with? Which one's given you more PTSD? Um, I would say the wartime, um, because there was, there's tangible damage, you know, that, that lingers, that constantly reminds me, um, you know, I have a TBI, which, uh, you know, just kind of gives me these, um, it's a TBI stands for a traumatic brain injury. Um, there was a lot of IEDs. That was the method of defense and offense by you know the locals over there and have been in numerous explosions and uh you know it really gives me these constant migraines and neck pain and just you know steady steady discomfort on a regular basis but i do consider myself fortunate but again it's it's a you know constant reminder of that trauma and those events so i'd say that's probably the main reason why they were more traumatic plus you spend every single day around man and these people would smile in your face and then turn their back on you later and you never know who's who out there we're amongst human beings all day long every day and we have to put a lot of trust in them on a lot of different levels at a lot of different times and uh you know, you just never know. Humans are the most unpredictable thing I've ever been around. Isn't that the truth? And I'm so sorry, like I said, that you had to go through all that. I mean, no one should have to deal with that. That is so horrible. But like I said, that's just one of the reasons why I really appreciate your service to our country so much. I really do. Thank you, brother. Oh, you're welcome. If you've had a dog man encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. Well, you've got a lot to unpack for us here tonight, Mike, so let's dive into it now. Please tell us about your encounters. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. So this is a pretty long, drawn-out scenario. I'll start from the beginning, at least from where I was able to pick up on what was happening, that there were dogmen present. I had heard about them. I had understood that they were there. And it wasn't that I was in disbelief. I, I'd say I had tunnel vision, and all I wanted to do was focus on the Sasquatch, and I was very good at blocking out anything else from being there. That was until it made itself very, very visible. So the first time was in the Pine Barrens, and I was by myself, and I could feel a reluctance and a, you know, almost a, a, a reverse magnetic energy, kind of like pushing me back, saying, you know, as if to say, like, hey, don't, don't come in here. But the stubborn human in me drove all that way, and I wanted to go in there. I didn't drive over there to just turn around, right? So I just pushed my way forward anyway. And, you know, looking back to hindsight 2020, I, I shouldn't have. But I was lucky once again and uh, consider myself fortunate. But there were multiple dogmen out there. And I could hear them communicating. Mind you, on Long Island, just to give a brief overlay of it the pine barrens are very 
it's like a hundred thousand acres on Long Island. It's very barren, like literally barren, and there's nobody out there. Uh, it's just kind of like a cryptid playground where nothing's off limits, and uh, people don't go out there. There are no trails. It's not like um, there there are trails in some parts, but most of them are like mountain biking trails, and it's not a prime hiking location especially with all the water and beaches and like state parks on the water that we have. We have so many state and county beautiful parks and beaches that nobody goes out there. But I was drawn there. I don't know why. I just, it's where I ended up. So I went in and I like a challenge and I like to switch things up. So on this particular day, oh, so I meant, what I meant to dive into was that we don't have any um, coyotes here. We don't have wolf. We don't have bear. We don't have big cats. We don't even have small cats or fisher cats, nothing. So we have fox and deer. That's about it. So many big birds of prey, but other than that, nothing you can mix up. You know, you you can't mix up what you're looking at. It's either a domestic dog or you got a dog man on your hands. And these... uh I don't know. Maybe maybe some people have super trained dogs elsewhere, but I don't know anybody with domestic dogs that can tactically move through the brush like a military unit. And uh, that's what I was seeing. And I want to give a description of them, but I don't remember much except that it was a darkish gray, not quite black, not quite gray, not quite silver. But this like dark gray, like a like a gun metal that almost seemed to be fluid with with their body. Um, it wasn't like mangy. It wasn't scattered. The hair. It was. It was. It seemed to flow with their body movement. I don't know how else to explain that. You know, except what I said. I I could just tell you what I saw. I don't I don't know anything that's hair moves along with its limbs perfectly like in synchronizing motion but this this is what was happening. They were on all fours the whole time. They were bounding from tree to tree very very quickly. It was almost like a flash. It was always when they were in my peripheral. I was having my camera out and I was holding my camera one way. Every If I had my head to the left, I was holding my camera to the right. And if I had my head to the right, I was holding my camera to the left in hopes to possibly capture something that was outdoing me at every, every angle. There would be a distraction, um, some sort of like clack or knock or bark or something that would make me whip my head in one direction and then where i was turned away from would be where they moved and it was this triangular mu movement between three of them and again i just could not see them it was just foom, foom, foom. almost like uh you know how the um, the contrails that people talk about all the time like the planes leave behind it was almost like that's all I could see was the tail end of the movement it made, if that makes sense. And at this point, I'm trying to back out slowly and slowly and slowly, but they're constantly moving forward, and I know how far I have to go. And as odd as this sounds, I saw what looked to be like a Sasquatch behind one of the trees. And it wasn't something that I would say was fully physical. Sometimes this is hard to explain, but I would say I knew what was there, and I knew that something other than the dog man was there, and sure, was way bigger than a person, and it was way more. The presence it had just kind of commanded the room. And I got the direct inkling, like, it communicated to me, go, go now and go. And I started to listen and I started to make progress and nothing was happening and making my way out. 
but continuously it, it kept going on because I kept stubbornly stopping and kind of like looking around and filming and I should have had a more sense of urgency and moved with a sense of purpose more so than I did. And I definitely pushed the boundaries. Eventually I did get another nudge, like go. And I did. And I left and I, I reluctantly did not go back to that place. Now, a couple of weeks later, most likely I had a subscriber come uh, he wanted to come visit and check things out. And we went a bunch of different places that he had seen videos of that he wanted to go. And that was one that he, he wanted to see. And so, you know, I just silly, silly me decided, okay, let's go. And as night started to fall, I'm just going to fast forward because uh, not much went on. Not not noteworthy anyway. For the few first, you know, a couple hours that we were there, we were just wandering around and, you know, just normal things, banging around the woods and not really getting too much. But as night started to fall, I'll reiterate, we do not have packs of canine or koi wolf, coyotes, wolves, nothing. It sounded like a pack of coyotes was moving in in a hurry. And we weren't far from the vehicle at this point, but it was parked on the road in the woods a little bit, but it was on the road. And there was a street light there, which gave this false sense of security. And I, looking back, I don't know why the car and the, the one street light gave this false sense of security. I, I still don't understand it to this day, but it did. It did. And this is this has been something that's happened to me multiple times where I felt this false sense of security because I was close to civilization or a road or something to that effect, but it doesn't seem to matter. And as this pack of whatever was coming towards us, I can only speculate, but it sounded like it was making a beeline for us. Like it knew we were there somehow. There was this huge ridge that went down probably about 15, 20 feet down, drop off the, trail we were using which looked to be like maybe a horse trail occasionally there was a farm nearby a horse farm nearby and uh there was something that popped up and popped back down and it was so fast i i i can't explain how fast it went up and down you know when a jack in the box shoots out of the box well imagine it went back down immediately in the same fashion but even faster, whack a mole remind, reminded me of whack a mole that game, you know, that arcade game where you try to hit the thing when it pops up. And uh, it, it did it twice. And I know the second time I got it on camera, but it just didn't do it justice when I looked back at it. It was not as intense as it was to look into those glowing eyes. <sighs> To know something has glowing eyes and can see you clear as day and you can't see it and what movements it's making and where it is and what it's doing is one of the scariest things out there. It can see your every single move and everything you're doing and you have no idea what's happening outside of your hand in front of your face. And as the coyotes or whatever, this pack of, you know, unknown canines got closer and closer. And that just happened. The second time it popped up, I got so scared that we went to the vehicle and I was like, let's go get in front of me. Go ahead of me. Go, go, go. I'm responsible for you. I shouldn't have brought you out here. Go ahead of me. Go. And I'll kind of, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, I was trying to put myself a little behind him in case something did happen. They would pick me. I felt so responsible at this point. And we got to the vehicle. And the fear, again, there was this false sense of safety. The fear started to turn into like, 
you know, nervous laughter, which eventually turned into like, man, that was crazy. Huh? Like, I can't believe that, you know, almost like we were out of the woods, but we weren't. We weren't yet. And we ended up actually doubling back in a few feet at one point. And this is probably about 10 minutes later. And we're still there and everything has calmed down to the point where there's really no no noise except normal noise out in the woods, if if anything. I can't recall, but there was no more of the howling. There was, you know, no more like phantom footsteps or anything to that effect. Just regular, regular wood feeling, you know, the regular woods. And there was something I can't explain to this day because the street light gave us a little bit of an extra glimpse. Probably our hand in front of our face, you know, visibility went to somewhere between five and ten feet. And whatever this was, was about two feet from our face. We could feel the breath. It sent... It sent... It sent chills down your spine. It was the most insane thing I've ever had happen. It vibrated. It was this loud... This loud... I, I, banshee comes to mind like screaming like a banshee comes to mind but it screamed at the top of its lungs or whatever it was and it was not a physical thing it was just but something was there screaming in our face and a train whistle is like if you ever been like right in front of the train and it pulls that whistle it was that times 10 and way, way higher. And you couldn't like you, you, you couldn't go and get a movie actress to 10 movie actresses to make this noise, you know, with a scary movie where the, where the females scream, you know, and if 10 of them were there screaming like this, it would not have equaled this. It was the scariest, loudest, intense thing I've ever experienced. And we left. We got the heck out of Dodge as fast as we could. And in a nutshell, that was really the end of that. Um, I think we kind of talked about it briefly. I remember trying to make, um, I always document after my outings in the woods, I try to self-document a little selfie video for myself about what happened so I don't forget uh, if I need to go back for any reason and I remember just the phone shaking out of my hands repeatedly and watching it back I remember seeing how stumbling I was over my words and I couldn't function could not formulate a thought I don't know how he was driving at all I have no idea I think it was a real big thrill for him a little bit I don't think he understood the dangers that could have been involved there. And, uh, yeah, it was just another one of those things where you're just lucky that that's all it was. Fast forward. I'd say that experience really, really affected me big time. I didn't go back over there. I don't think I've been back over there at all since maybe if I did it was once maybe briefly to kind of work through trauma if anything but I don't even, I, I if I did I've shut it down so I started to find other locations like I always do and uh, challenge myself and you know switch it up and uh, I found a place pretty close to home which is kind of nice it's wide open nobody seems to know it's there a lot of woods, a lot of open areas, too, and uh, really just a beautiful, beautiful property. And it's uh, it's state-owned, I guess. I'm pretty sure it's state-owned anyway. But it goes all the way into the back down this road that looks like you're not supposed to be back there. So I guess that's why a lot of people don't go in. It has a guard booth, but no guard, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. and. Uh, if you just navigate through it into the very, very back, it's 
gorgeous and wide open and just like a, you know, wooded playground. And I do, I go back to it because I know nobody else does. There was a lot of times I'd bring my dog there because it was, the grass wasn't too tall. And a lot of different things, a lot of different reasons, but there, it was really a lot of fun for me for a very long time until one particular night. I had not been doing anything really at nighttime. In hindsight, most likely it was because of what happened that night that we just discussed. But on this particular occasion, it was twilight. One of my favorite times to go out is the blue hour in the morning or sunrise hour or the twilight hour. I like the morning and, the, you know, it's like shift change, right? Nocturnal things go in or out. They come home or they go out. And uh, the other things go to sleep or they go, you know, they're heading out. So very active. Very, very active. And it's just a theory of mine that the cryptids are the same way. But I would get a lot of activity that way. So I tried it. And that particular night, I ended up staying into the night. And so the way this place is lined up is there's this open field. And it's always mowed somehow. I've never seen anybody there that mows the lawn, but who knows. And then there's thick, thick, tall grass and thick, thick brush. And the, the trees have uh, almost like a, a network of uh, hollowed out areas underneath. You know those big trees that cover, they, they grow outward and, and kind of grow. Uh, the deer love it because they walk all under it. And it's, it's, it's almost like a little, you know, hidden tunnel system down there. I like to refer to it as, remember when you were a kid and you'd uh, take your sheet, you know, grab your mom's bed sheets and like tuck all four corners in and make a tent and, uh, you know, you'd crawl around down there. It's uh, something similar to that. And there's these lanes that kind of go, you know, in and out of the different trails that you could walk. And there's one that is very narrow. And it has these those trees, and some of them overlap over that tight trail. And I always see the deer frequenting in and out of it, and I I never really thought much about it. I didn't ever get too close to it. Uh, I'd never went down that particular trail for uh, no no particular reason. Just didn't really seem important because it led to the long road it, it it didn't lead back to where i parked it it led to the long road that i had to take to get back there it's just a little back street with street lights on it and it's it's way behind all these expensive buildings and stuff that are just vacant you know never used i don't know why so again there was that false sense of security too with the street lights so as it got dark instead of coming back across the big, you know, open area and stumbling through the darkness, I said, oh, maybe I'll cut that way and head towards the lights. You know, I'll, I'll get in the street. I'll get in the street because that's that feels safer. The feeling at that point was very uneasy. And uh, mind you, I, I, I do apologize because there is some trauma here where I I believe I've tried to bury some things, so I'm doing gonna do my best, but there there was an uneasy feeling from what I can remember. And I think that is originally why I was trying to fast forward out of the you know wooded area and out into the fields and then back, you know, to my vehicle or back towards uh, I, that road and the street lights. It was uh it was just giving me this sense of comfort that I thought I should, I should go for. So as I went down this, this tight lane, and it, usually it's very wide. In the, in the winter time, especially, it, it's very wide. It's a very wide lane, but in the in the thick of it, it's just, it just overlaps and 
it comes very, very tight. And towards the street part of it, it's I'd say it's about a hundred yards long, give or take. You know, maybe give or take twenty yards. So as I get towards the street, I'm really starting to get comfortable. And I really have my guard down and this is when the the um discomfort or possible uncomfortability change to utter fear and just i mean sheer terror and i don't want to use the word attacked here because i i feel like it's used too loosely but i was intimidated to a degree where I, I I don't think I've ever since the military taken my knife off my you know out of my pocket or out, off my belt. It came out so fast out of that thick underbrush that I was talking to you about. It was like a cannon ball just shot out of the trees. There was no winding up. There was no, you know, oh, I hear, you know, it's running. Something's running towards me like you would hear a horse gallop towards you or, you know, or a deer running for a little while. It was like right out of a cannon just took off. Like it was almost, it was almost like they were 20 feet away from me or, and I just didn't know it. But. It lunged so quickly and so fast. It was in my face within seconds. And the best way I can describe it is, you know, when you walk through those Halloween haunted houses and you're just waiting for, you know, something to jump out at you and everything's in close proximity. And then all of a sudden something just lunges out. That multiplied to an unequivocal speed and a unequivocal fear and the first one lunged out to the point where it came within I would say three three feet it felt like it felt like it's you know snout was in front of my eyeball like an inch in front of my eyeball but i have to be realistic here and say i'd say it was within three feet now the second one lunged out and i'm backpedaling now as best i can and scrambling for the street and for whatever reason they lunged out and pulled back they could have done it anything they chose to they looked identical to the ones i was describing to you earlier that gunmetal gray if you will but it it's hard to say it's almost like a peppered gray like there's maybe black uh roots if you will and then maybe it changes like gray and into like almost like a lighter gray and i don't know how to explain this necessarily but it wasn't really i don't want to say it was hair because it was hair but i don't want to say it was like fine or thick it reminded me somewhat of a porcupine uh how they have quills now it's still a hair but and it's not quills but it's, it's still a hair but it was just that like sleek looking um very fluid and very like firm and yeah nothing i've seen before so this is the time where I pulled out my knife and started you know I screamed some obscenity that I won't repeat here and utter sheer fear just coursing through my body and they backed up right back in 
They could have done whatever they chose to me at that point. I had no chance. It's actually quite humorous looking back that I drew a blade on them. Um, just ridiculous. When you when I when I really look at it in hindsight, when I look at the size of them, they were. Uh, I remember they had this like cocked this cocked leg like um, when they were standing up like the um, almost like a little bow in it. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but almost like an elbow. It just had this little like uh, not little at all, but it had like a bend to it. They didn't stand straight up. Is what I'm getting at. I guess they had like a almost like they were on a. What are those things called where they jack, jack, a jack, a car jack, like, you know, like that. Um, very, very massive, though. Very massive. Not as tall, maybe, as uh, I've heard other reports. I'd say they were they weren't massive, much taller than me, somewhere in the six to seven foot range. Um, probably closer to six and a half. And I beelined for the street. But I still had to go all the way through now. Down the road. Under now now the sense of security I was looking for turned on me. Because now I was in the dark with woods on both sides of me. I can see a bunch of eyes shine lying down low and tactically moving as I'm walking down this road. I can see them bounding. They would close their eyes and move, and then they would reappear. And then one would close its eyes and move and bound and reappear next to it. And then they would. there was a couple of them, at least three, maybe four. And they were very low, and they, they moved up and down very tactically and really smoothly. And they went the whole way as I went down. And the reverse side of that streetlight made me feel now like I was on display, like I was a rotisserie chicken in the middle of stop and shop or, you know, wherever you shop at. Um, it, that's what it felt like now. Where the, the thing I wanted to get to most to feel safe when I was feeling unsafe now totally flipped the script. <sighs> As I'm going, they're moving next to me. I'm moving next to me. And I'm doing my best to keep my calm and stay cool. But I know that this is not going to end well. I don't know if I'm really processing much of anything. Um, again, this is like where I, I noticed that I kind of have blocked out a little bit of some, some stuff. Because I'm, it was just so, so traumatic. Uh, I appreciate you, Vic, because we've, we've talked about it quite a bit now. And, and I've worked through a couple of like little things and understandings. And uh, have gotten me to the point where I'm able to sit here and discuss it uh, without rushing through completely. But in a nutshell, I made it to my vehicle. And I was able to leave. I remember locking my doors and rolling my windows up and i remember i was leaning into the middle of my car i was trying to be as center as i could in my truck because i didn't want to be close to the windows i didn't want to be closer to either window because i thought that i, I just wanted to be as far as possible from the wood line and, and there was one on each side of me that's how scared i was this is the way my brain was processing things and telling me to react to put myself i drive sideways leaning into the middle of the car uncomfortably because that's you know more safe until you get out of here right and i did eventually i got out of there but that was a short-lived uh, safe haven now you always hear people say be careful because they'll follow you home. And uh, I don't know how that works when it comes to these guys. I don't know much about Dogman. I still don't. I respect what you do, Vic. I really do. But I still, I still have a 
from all this, I still have a protection measure where I just keep a healthy distance and a healthy respect and stay away because I know what they're capable of. And this is where the story goes. Up to this point, these, these dogmen, uh, not one, not two, you know, there was multiple on multiple occasions could have, you know, done a lot of things to me, like took me out, hurt me, whatever they so choose. And I still walked away every time. Now, it was different. The next time I experienced them, I was at home. I live in the suburbs. The neighbors are not far from one another. Even if it's late at night, if there was a huge ruckus, I'd imagine people would probably come out. But I was being tormented for quite a while. The first night was the scariest, I'd say. I came out of my, you know, I have an apartment on the back side of a house and a little side entrance. And I came out of my door and I lit a cigarette. And out of the corner of my eye, I can see something that just doesn't belong. It just doesn't belong there. And I don't, I'm not really figuring out what it is yet. It's dark out there. Sensor lights aren't working again. I don't know why. It's just something that kept happening. No matter what I did to fix them. And through this particular tree that's pretty trimmed down now, uh, I saw something glowing. And I turned my head and there was these red glowing eyes. And against the moonlight I guess it was somewhat of a cloudy night but there was still a, a difference between the, the black shingles on the roof and the sky and in between those dark shingles and that gray with a little bit of lighted sky there was a figure and it was on all fours leaning downward its butt was up towards the peak of the roof, and its shoulders were, and, you know, face were aiming down, facing down. And I have about five feet between me and my fence, maybe ten feet, give or take, and then there's probably another ten yards at least between, probably... 15 yards between that fence and their home and they are a two-story house and it's a pretty big house and that's where this thing sat and was staring at me and it was fully flesh as far as i'm concerned uh you know it wasn't tangible because i couldn't touch it it was way over there but it as far as it was it was too close for comfort for me it had these huge shoulders. You know, there's show dogs like pit bulls and stuff where they're like, they're huge and like they look like little tanks. Um, it was like that, but it was on like a giant German shepherd, a black German shepherd. And it was in pounce mode. Like it was, it was, that's what I mean. Like its shoulders and arms were like cocked out because I I believe it was planning to lunge. Again, this is perspective because it didn't lunge. In the end, it did not lunge and it didn't do anything in particular, but it scared me. Again, it was scaring me. It was there. It was letting me know it knew where I was. I'm just speculating. Because um, I, I can I can only do that. I can only do that. But oh, the facts are that there was that thing sitting up there watching me. And I had no control over it. So I decided to start calling around and 
trying to get help, which uh, I'll, I'll breeze through that process because hindsight, I don't really know how productive any of it was but there was points where I, they were uh, the, the help I was asking for had me doing certain rituals and uh, different things where you know I was trying to make amends with them and and uh, some of it was gifting some of it was odd things around the homes similar to a protection for a spirit or something to that effect then some of it was leaving gifts out in the, in the area uh, it took me a lot of time I lost the whole month of everything I loved. I had to put it all on hold because there was nothing more important to me than making sure that I, uh, I don't, you know, I wasn't trying to wage war with something that could sneak up on me like that. So I did my best to make things better, at least as well as I knew how. Looking back, I think what I was doing was I was gaining understanding. I was gaining a mutual respect. I was losing fear. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of maybe what, what helped this situation. After that first, night it was the scariest night of my life there were some days and some nights that were silent completely silent nothing sometimes for days at a time but then there would just be a night where you know it seemed like every other night where it was just silent again and nothing was around and i would be outside and uh, the the fence would just start shaking and the trees would start shaking and in multiple spots and almost like there was like multiple linebackers, like an offensive line just behind the fence, just rattling it at different times, just hitting into it. Uh, There was other times where it would feel like I was just being watched and I just didn't know from where. I would say the hardest part for me was not knowing when they were going to come, not knowing how to fix it. And when I did think I had answers on how to fix it, how long was it going to take? Would it work? Were my kids going to get harmed? Should I go to somebody? You know, there's so many things that go through your mind. And and it really makes you feel like you're alone in the world. And you really don't know what to turn to. Because this is it just sounds like craziness. It sounds like... it. It just sounds like... A crazy person. When you put it all together, it just, to a regular person who's going about their life and has never experienced anything like this and has never come across anything or even believes in anything closely, remotely like this, you know, there's there's not many people you can reach to. And uh, I really appreciate you, Vic, because you've done a lot for me. Just even in the past few days, it's it's been very helpful. And uh, I hope I did some justice here. But I want to round out the the whole thing and just kind of give some hope here and some positive insight to the whole to the whole thing. And I just always want to touch back on there could have been a lot of times where they hurt me or worse and it didn't happen and there was a lot of times where they were here and they again they could have did the same thing whether they were here or i was out there it didn't matter they had the upper hand and they knew it and i think they got off on the fear i think they really enjoyed instilling the fear in me and 
it, it did work for quite a while. But after a while, it seemed like everything died down. And I didn't want to get complacent and just act like everything was okay again and manage to get back on their bad side somehow or whatever the case was. So I always constantly just have a mutual respect and try to kind of keep my cool and keep my fear out of it if possible. Uh, people ask me all the time, how are you so cool out there? Oh, you so, you know, you, you know, you, I don't know how you do that. You know, you're so whatever, you know, what, whatever different phrases people have, I won't say here, but it's not, it's, uh, it's what you have to do. You know, you don't want to be cocky, but you can't show fear either. You know, fear will keep you alive, but too much of it will get you in trouble. And don't hang on to this stuff like I did. I hung on to it for too long. I started to bury a lot of it. I thought it was the best thing for everybody, for me to, myself included, for me to just sweep it under the rug. But the problem with that is that lump in the rug, you got to walk over it a lot of different times, over and over and over. So it's best to just handle it. And, uh, you know, there's nobody better than Vic when it comes to this stuff. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in that, especially now. So I just want to thank you again. And uh, I, I hope I did a little bit of justice here. And I hope my details weren't too spotty and whatever. But I, I guess that's in a nutshell, unless you got questions, Vic. Oh, do I? <laughs> I've got a <laughs> bunch of them. I'll tell you what, though, Mike. We're about an hour into this, and I don't want to shortchange all these questions I want to ask you about what you told us about your experiences. Would you mind coming back for a part two so I could run you through all those questions? No, oh, of course. Why not? Great. Well, I'll get with you after we finish here tonight, and we'll get that scheduled for next week, and we'll take it from there. But before we get out of here, I do want to ask you about something. Earlier this week, we recorded an episode of My Paranormal Experience where you came on and talked about your experiences, actually two encounters that you had with a rake. One of those encounters involved a Sasquatch saving you from that rake. Mm -hmm. Did you have that rake encounter, the second rake encounter, before you had these dogman encounters or after it? I believe that the rake encounters were afterwards, yes. Yeah. They were pretty far after. And uh, it was an interesting thing. You know, I think it was just more or less wrong place, wrong time. And uh, there was just, it was just coming out of those underground areas uh, on those overcast days. And like I had told you when we did that, it's it's like a big, big federal building area and a lot of underground tunnels and a lot of woods around them that people don't use that have no trails, which is, tends to be where I bump into a lot of the weird stuff. And yeah, that was a uh, very, very interesting experience to say the least yeah interesting doesn't do it any justice that thing it sure sounds to me like it had bad intentions but yeah speaking of that if you do want to listen to that episode if you check out the description for tonight's episode of dogman encounters you'll see that i've posted a link to that episode of my paranormal experience where mike talks about those rake encounters but having said that mike it's time for us to call it tonight so i just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Anytime, brother. Thank you. Oh, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much, and have a great night.